Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the American Cinematheque, the virtual American Cinematheque. My name is Jim Hemphill, and I'll be your host for tonight's discussion of Shirley. Uh, just a couple quick things to let you know. Uh, you can probably see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for Josephine Decker, feel free to write it in there, and you can do that at any time starting now throughout the discussion. I'm going to start Talk. I'm going to start with Josephine, ask her some questions to get things rolling. But then uh, in a little bit, we will start taking audience questions. So please feel free to uh, enter them in there. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest tonight, the director of Shirley, Josephine Decker. Josephine. Hi. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm and so grateful. It's like the, the these are the moments when you, I mean, it's so funny to talk. This, this is, these are my experiences of having any audience, you know. And so, you, but it, uh, you know, my internet wasn't working, so it's like I have to see the audience through my tiny phone. <laughs> the the feeling, the feeling is still there, though. Surprisingly, Thank yeah, I know. You. I hope someday we can uh, actually watch the movie again on the big screen at the Egyptian oh, of the Air yeah. or something and do this again. But uh, in the meantime, so you know, watching Shirley when I first started watching it. I was thinking it seemed very different from your last movie, Madeline's Madeline. But then as it progressed and I saw what it was really about, I was like, well, okay, there's, it's another movie where there's sort of, uh, you know, mentor protege relationship. You sort of are dealing with some of the same themes in terms of how artists have this kind of vampire like nature, but also destroy themselves. And I guess my first question, I'm curious how much of that is, conscious and how much is it just that that those ideas are so hardwired into your dna that you kind of naturally seek out things where you're going to be able to explore them you know what i mean is it something that you uh you know yeah like i it was totally unconscious actually i mean for shirley i loved the script i loved the character that sarah had written you know shirley sarah gubbins is just such a great writer she wrote um she adapted I Love Dick, that's Amazon show from the book. Um, she's also written on Better Things, and uh, she's going to write on a million more amazing things, I'm sure. But she she just has an like an insight into the kind of like these these characters that they're messy in the way that they they're not they don't fit into one category. They are just so many conflicting things, and it's it's just a pleasure to watch them. They're they're so human. They're so real. So I think I have really enjoyed. Um, I just loved, I fell in love with that character and um, the world. And also as a, I've studied literature in college, so it was just fun to get to think, you know, to go back to that and to that kind of research and delving into a writer's life. Um, so, so it was actually funny. I didn't, I wasn't thinking about how many crossovers there were with the thematically until actually Sarah came. So we had about a year between me getting attached and then the, the shoot happening. Um, and I was finishing Madeline's Madeline that year. So she came to a rough cut screening and I just remember the movie ended and she, we kind of looked at each other and she was like, like muse, you know, messed up muse situation kind of thing. <laughs> like we really, it's like, and I sort of, it was the first time I really like clicked how similar the two projects were. Cause you, know, you pick a project and it just feels so unique. You know, it's sort of like, you know, it's like falling in love. You just, you don't even realize that you fell in love with two tall gentlemen, you know, but, <laughs> but then at the, at the end, you're like, oh yeah, these are the same, same awesome uh, kind of strange binary um, that, that is being explored. Mm -hmm. Well, and how did the, this come to you? I mean, I know, you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, you've written all the other movies you've directed, all the other features. This is your first time doing something with another writer. So A, how did it come to you? And B, how, what was that like collaborating with another writer for the first time? Um, uh, you know, so it came to me, I actually had been talking to, so Miranda July acted in my last film and I, I was at a brunch at her house with her partners, Mike Mills. And I was talking to Mike about how badly I wanted to work on something that I didn't write because I loved working on Madeline's Model. And it was also a very long process, uh, that I, that, it's really the writing process was super challenging and I'm I love writing but also it's, it's I think it's the hardest part I'm I'm better when there's less options I get I like to have too much too many options overwhelm me so um I told him that I was really interested in that he actually sent my work to his agent Blair Blair Cohan at UTA and she I think is the one who brought me up in the room and, and mentioned me and you know sort of said like why don't we look at Josephine and 
really, I really appreciated that and, and was grateful that, you know, that, that, that she brought me up and then, and then Sarah looked at my work and it felt like a fit and it, it, it did feel like a fit. I think it really felt like there was a, um, the kinds of the way that I think I've been exploring cinema, there's so much in common with the way that Shirley writes and the way that I've been trying to make movies um, that I wasn't even aware of really. And, and then when I found Shirley's work, I was like, my God, this is like, yeah, you find finding a mentor. Uh, you know, she's she's dead, but all of these books are like this path of how do you tell art in this way? How do you move from the conscious into the subconscious realms? And um, so very grateful that I got to get involved. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as a Shirley Jackson fan, one of the things I liked about the movie was I felt like you found a lot of visual corollaries for her writing. Like you, you did sort of find this, like the cinematic way of expressing the same kinds of moods that are in her writing. And I was wondering, what were some of the kind of, A, was that what your intention was going in? And, and then if it was, um, what were some of the kind of guiding visual principles you had? Definitely the goal going in was to make the film feel like a Shirley Jackson story or novel, like you were in one side, one of her works. I think that was, the, that was kind of the highest goal, much higher than trying to be loyal to any of like her life, you know, that her real life, obviously this is, definitely not a biopic, it's an adaptation of a fictional um, uh, book, basically, that's about, it's like a fictionalized Shirley in the book, so it's so many degrees removed from a reality, but um, really we were very set on, like, it just, we were like, it has to feel like you're in a Shirley Jackson story, and how did we do that? I mean, there were a lot of things in the script that Sarah was doing, you know, this, she surely often writes these, these women, one of whom is really kind of effective in life and like you know or maybe like a, a more traditional idea of, of a good woman like good at baking gets along well with men is generous and kind um and then a woman who's a little bit more messy misanthropic but hilarious and has great insight and sense of humor and so those that was obviously the premise around which we were sort of basing the film and then um you know Sh Shirley does this thing where she'll she kind of puts reality and the subconscious like right on top of each other often and sometimes it's really clear that she's doing that um you know obviously the film talks about the book hangs a man towards the beginning of the book hangs a man there's sort of two like there's just one section where there's two simultaneous conversations like one is with her family and one is with this like detective who's investigating a murder and she's sort of having and it's just an Im imaginary detective she's and she's having which is having the two conversations at the same time sort of uh, and then, and, but there it's very clear that the detective is not real. In that book also, there's a best friend to the main character, Natalie, uh, her name's Tony. And over the course of the book, you sort of begin to question like, is Tony real at all, you know? Um, and um, so, but but at first she's introduced very much like you're with a real character. You're with you're with the, you feels like she's a real character for a lot of the books. So I think those kinds of things like playing with the ways that the subconscious arises and how explicit it is are things that I feel like it's a really basic or inherent to Shirley's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's yeah. I was curious about how you work with the actors because you do, in terms of expressing all those ideas you're talking about, you do a lot of very very unusual things with the camera and. In my experience, directing actors, whenever they have a big moment and the camera's not on them in a kind of conventional close-up, they start to get a little nervous. Like, they, they get a little edgy. Like, why, why is the camera over there? And I'm curious, you know, you're dealing here for the first time, really, with kind of bigger stars, you know, uh, very experienced actors. What kinds of conversations did you have with them to sort of make them feel comfortable and secure with what you were doing? Yeah, well, I remember that we, we had this... <laughs> this midnight kitchen scene, um, uh, which we was, uh, we were just talking about it in a different Q and A earlier today. Elizabeth, L Lizzie, and I were, were Elizabeth Moss, and I were talking about it because it was one of those those exactly these kinds of moments where I, Sterla, our DP, and I we had these different kind of approaches for different camera possibilities, and um, one that I was really excited about was we called Creature, which was that the camera, for these kind of dreamier moments where you're sort of like, is this really happening? Like, this is when the two women kind of meet each other, Rose and Shirley come together in the middle of the night, they have kind of a, a drink together, and it's sort of their first time to really connect, I think. Um, 
and so we had this idea of a creature which is sort of there's obviously a baby that's inside the movie this that's in Rose's belly and so the idea was to almost have the camera be a baby it's something that is very close to you and then if it wants to move to the other person it has to go across the surface it can't just like pan it has to kind of like walk across or crawl across so um so we had like these shots where the camera would go all the way down to the floor and across the tiles and then up to the other woman and then like over to the, just follow her over to the table, but then have to cross the table. And, um, and I remember the, like, it takes a minute though to get that right, you know, without losing too much of the actual performances that I remember Lizzie, like in the first or second shot was like, do you want to just film like faces? Like <laughs> our face, like we're performing the scene and like there's the tile floor. <laughs> <laughs> that you're getting a lot of but like we are the scene and um but we found I think with that with that scene we kind of once the DP got into it and really found his rhythm I think there was something really magical that happened with the, the combination of the camera and the characters and um uh yeah but it did it did take a bit of conversations around that to sort of like get everyone on board and clear with what we were doing and that there was a performance in the camera which I think is not necessarily something I guess I don't know how every other director thinks. But I just know that for me, the camera is one of the most important performers in a work. Um, and it's sort of like a, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a window into, this is how you see, this is how the audience experiences the movie. There's a spirit inside the camera. So it feels really important to have the camera um, be, like have this inner life and make its own choices and make unconventional choices like being a creature. <laughs> Well, that idea of the camera being a performer leads me to another question because you, I know a lot of your movies you've, uh, you know, dealt with, you've had a lot of improvisation and things like that. And I'm curious how that applies to the camera. Like how many of you are, how much of your visual style is pre-planned and how much are you kind of finding along the way uh, during the shoot? Both. It's like really a combination, a strong combination of both. So we have, we had like a bunch of different ideas, which are pretty, pretty much did kind of go through the film. So we, I think there were like five, I could look them up, but there were like five different camera approaches. Maybe, maybe and I think we ended up more with like four, but there was this, so there was this creature for the, um, you know, these kind of like dreamy scenes between Shirley and Rose. There were there was this there was an approach that we called I think it was called smush, which was also we called it like stew jazz, which is Sterla, our <laughs> which is basically that Sterla really lets the movement of the actor guides camera work and and has a very intuitive approach and you and you don't necessarily plan the shot so much as feel the shot and let let the let the cameraman kind of like follow the scene and obviously the DP is there in rehearsal watching everything and we're sort of when we settle on a blocking making sure the blocking can work for what what you know he will have to do and then um and then so for, for that it's sort of like following a character's energy and, and letting action and movement drive the camera choices and like land from one character to another um and then we had a very specific look for the town like we wanted Shirley Jackson in her in her books and stories there's this real ominous superficiality to the towns that she often writes about they're very um, there's like always kind of a menacing, uh, gossipy, kind of perfect, but not perfect presence in, of the town. So we had those very locked off and sort of a safe, but fake kind of a look, I guess you could say. So that was a, that was our approach for that. So, so we had a lot of, um, approaches. And so what, what we would do is kind of like, once we had developed, I think it was four or five total, I I'm, the last one was for the Paula visions. It was called float. <laughs> Um, but so once we had all those approaches then we could apply them to the different scenes and, um, and then we found out, we figured out that that like stew jazz kind of like really fit with a lot of the movie. Um, but, uh, yeah, but then there was a lot of, we had, I, originally we had like one or two other approaches that we kind of just threw away because we realized that the handheld work was that being, allowing him to be so intuitive was allowing us to really focus on performance and not have to not be like dealing with a dolly and a bunch of technical stuff. So we can't, I think that was, so there was a bit of improvisation in terms of like letting things go. And then obviously when you're handheld, I think there's a lot of, or at least the way I shoot it, I think there's a ton of improvisation because you're always letting the actors guide you. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me like one of the challenges with this movie is you've got 
uh, a character in Curly who, A, doesn't leave the house much, so you're shooting a huge chunk of it in that setting. And then also, uh, she's, a, you know, she's a writer, and I always feel like this is one of the hardest things to, to depict on screen, is like, how do you, how do you make writing interesting or, or convey what it's like to be a writer? And I was wondering how you kind of rose to those challenges, or if they were, if it was challenging. How to convey about being a writer, and what was the first one? Well, just uh, dealing with the fact that so much of the movie takes place in one location. Oh, the house. Yes. You know, the, the house, so our production designer, Sue Chan, is such a genius, and she just, she just kind of went at it. She, has, she hired a really great set deck, Alex Lind, who just, you know, went to town and, and did so much work on that house, and it was always, it was like always getting better. I feel, we shot in the house for three weeks and it was constantly like getting more interesting. <laughs> so, um, and there were so many great details that they had kind of witchy elements like cicada shells and um, feathers. And I think there was like a weird spinning wheel in one room. <laughs> um, so, and then the writer, you know, so it's interesting one of the things that was maybe the hardest about the film when we got to editing was that we realized that even though it was so important for the end of the film that we attract Shirley's journey of writing this book, but that the meat of the film was really taking place around, um, you know, relationships. It was like, Shirley, where is Shirley in relationship to Stanley? Where is Shirley in relationship to Rose? And you didn't necessarily always feel where she was in relationship to the book, like viscerally. You weren't like having an experience of the writing. Um, and, and it was one of those things that on the page, <clears throat> you know, in the script pages, it'll say like, Paula, Shirley envisions Paula, and this happens. But when you're watching it, it's not always so clear, you know, who's there and what's happening. And so um, our editor, David Barker, who is just really brilliant at um, uh, solutions to problems like that, he kind of diagnosed that really early. He was like, I think for the ending to work, we really need to feel the book. And what if we hear Shirley writing the book? Like, what if we put in sections where we can hear the writing? And to me, that was really defining part of the experience. And it was, I remember the first time we watched the film down and it really like worked, you know, when you can kind of feel like, oh, this is a movie now. It's not just like a bunch of scenes in a row. <laughs> um, was when we put, when we had the voiceover in and, and really, um, like had it, it pulled the film together you just felt that you know, and Lizzie did such a great job of performing that Elizabeth Moss like performing it we call her Lizzie so I just want to make sure everyone knows who, who I'm talking about um but she I thought the way that we kind of worked out her performance of that in the ADR was really exciting too because it, you know there's moments where she can tell she's frustrated and then there's moments where you can tell she's like in the discovery process and the writing is flowing and 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 Sarah Govins also did a beautiful job writing because you can tell sort of like the, that voiceover helps you understand not only where she is in relationship to the book, but how Rose is affecting uh, her writing. And you can sort of tell like that one moment where she says, um, Paula always, what is it? like, oh God, it's been a minute since I saw the movie. <laughs> Paula always wanted to, um, thought her life didn't matter, didn't care if she lived or died or something like that. She directly quotes Rose um, in the writing. And so you sort of start to feel like, oh, this is a conversation that's happening between them. And um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought you guys actually did a really great job of conveying what the writing process is like and how neurotic it is and all those things. I thought it was, it was really great. Um, I'm going to go, I'm getting a bunch of questions from the audience here. Great. So I'm going to ask you a few of those. Um, the first one is, was there any involvement at any stage from Shirley Jackson's family or estate? You know, there wasn't. Um, and uh, yeah, because we were writing a fictional, because we, cause, cause we were adapting the fictional novel and we weren't adapting her biography, I think we were all pretty careful to try to not, um, you know, to try to fictionalize Shirley enough that she would, it would be clear that she is a fictional character. So many of, so much of the timeline of her life, like, doesn't really work with the timeline of the movie. Her inspiration, like her, I think her spirit is in the movie, um, but definitely like her real life in the movie don't really like mesh that well. And so, um, so yeah, so we were kind of, we kind of just stayed away from trying to, trying to do any of that. I think that would be an amazing movie though. My God, I mean, to collaborate with them and to make a real bio. I think, I think Lizzie's on interested. So <laughs> She's very, very excited. She's like, let's do a franchise, the Shirley Jackson franchise. Yeah. 
Uh, well, that sort of leads into another audience question here, which says, do you think the late 1940s and early 1950s were a perfect breeding ground for Shirley Jackson's uh, creative conception and evolution? Wow, you know, it's certainly a very interesting moment. I mean, I remember really right before I pitched on the project, I had seen um, the, it was an exhibit at MoMA, Female Post-War Abstractionists. And there was this really fascinating movement of, of abstraction in painting at the time. And I think, um, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, who knows how you become what the artist you become. Uh, I know that Shirley was obsessed with folklore. She, she learned a ton of like traditional English ballads. She played a lot of instruments actually. Um, and, uh, but I think, you know, the, the thing that I think was so special about that time, you know, one of the things Shirley was most known for in her life, which isn't really something that's talked about in our film, are her short stories about her family. So she had four kids and she wrote these hilarious short stories about her family, um, Life Among the Savages and uh, is one of the collections, and I'm forgetting the name of the other collection that she had, but, but these stories were super famous. And actually this was some of the most money that she made um, for her family from her writing was for these short stories, not for her more serious like literary works. Um, it was these things that were going to like women's magazines that were about being kind of a shitty mom. Like, <laughs> I mean, not a shitty mom, but like a, she was trying, she was just like, she was, she was talking about how, what a wreck you can, you know, that like you don't get it all right. And I think that was a really important voice for that moment to, you know, all this kind of like be the perfect housewife and um, the kind of individualism that r rose up in that time period and the, um, and the kind of industrial and commercial, uh, so these new ways of being that were sort of like uh, the advertising to housewives and to the perfect housewives. I think um, Shirley was, really an active voice in the other direction um and so i think that was i think that's pr partly the breeding ground it's also interesting though because i feel like one of the things that's so special about shirley's writing is how timeless it is and mm -hmm. i think you know she's she i think so much of her work like the lottery she clearly has a view there's a she's an outsider perspective that i think she probably would have felt in any era um and, um, you know, but, she, and it's interesting because I think Shirley was really in a way kind of, you know, an, an activist and she was really, um, she, she started this newspaper um, or it was a literary journal with Stanley when they were in college that was kind of an anti-racist, anti-fascist newspaper or little literary journal. Um, and uh, one of her books, The Road Between the Walls sort of addresses racism. And so she was, she was really thoughtful about that. And actually, you know, she was married to Stanley, who was a Jewish man, who at the time that was like incredibly controversial. Like she didn't tell her parents that she had gotten married until she was already pregnant. Um, and so uh, there, yeah, it was, she was, she was like way, 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 way ahead of her time in a lot of ways, but also obviously a product of that moment. She was responding and rejecting and reacting and, and um, I think, attempting to make her own way. And obviously, yeah, um, I could talk about her for a million years. I, I love that woman. She's a ins deep inspiration and she is so timeless. And I think the writing that she was doing, I guess what I was gonna say about the lottery is that it's about institutionalized oppression, you know, like couldn't be more relevant to like all the conversations we're having now. It's about a society that annually stones to death a member of society because no one remembers doing anything else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a pretty, She's a, she's a very, very um, exciting and thoughtful writer who, who, yeah, I think was way ahead of her time. Well, that timeless quality too, I feel like you kind of capture that in the production design of your movie because I think your approach to period is really interesting in that you get the period details just right, but there's also this kind of immediacy to the movie and this liveliness. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about that, like how, did, how you wanted to approach period in Shirley. Yeah, well, I I wanted I definitely didn't want it to feel stuck in time, and I think so. That was a specific, you know, goal was to not have it feel too periody, um, and to give it that visceral quality that you wouldn't. So it, I didn't want it to feel or look like a film that could have just come from the from the late '40s. I wanted it to feel like a film that we made now. Um, 
got set in that time. So um, I guess that was that was a lot of the thinking and the approach. And then and a lot of it was just intuitive and what made sense for the story. And I guess I'm going going from my own instincts and you know, my instincts are the instincts of now. Like I grew up making documentaries on mini DV cameras, you know, so where you could shoot like thousands of hours of footage. It's such a different moment, obviously, to be shooting than um, like the Hitchcock days. Mm -hmm. uh, well, another audience question here is, uh, how do you factor current modern psychological ideas and interpretation into revisiting a historical non-fictional character? How do you factor current, wait, you say it again? Modern psychological interpretation. I guess basically when you're dealing with a period character, how do you, uh, I, guess, I, I guess it's how do, how do modern psychological ideas kind of apply to that? I mean, Gosh, I guess you guys would have to tell me. I mean, I think, I think um, you know, one of the things that did excite me about this movie was just the idea that we were going to, you know, really give, you know, pay homage to a great female artist um, who probably should be a household name, but really, for some reason, I didn't know her name. You know, I wasn't, when I got, oh, Shirley Jackson, like that, oh, that's the lot, you know, she wrote the lottery. I read the lottery in high school. Like, you know, she's not a, she's not a name that you necessarily recognize in our culture, which I think, I mean, I think a lot of people do know her work, but I think it's also, um, she was the foundation of a lot of, you know, the, she's, she's a huge influence on a lot of horror writers, um, and authors and creators. Guillermo del Toro adores her, Neil Gaiman, um, Stephen King, like these, you know, so, so she's, she had a big impact. Um, her writing had a huge impact. And so I think, uh, it's always, it's always wonderful. It's a gift to get to look to history and, um, and then revisit like these, these, you know, greats who hopefully then affect us today. Mm -hmm. uh, the next audience question is, where do you find inspiration for your surreal effects in your films? Huh, inspirations. Um, well, I read a lot of poetry. Poetry's my thing. <laughs> and poetry always has, it has a great logic because it's, you know, the, we think of so many things in terms of like three act structure or narrative logic, but there's a real logic to poetry, which is sort of like a more musical logic of sort of a repetition of themes or imagery that crescendos into a certain direction that you, but you don't really know that you're going to end up where you end up. But then um, once you get there, you're like, oh, you know, I, can't, I, do, I don't know how we got here, but I'm here and it's like the best place to be. And I, I love that about poetry. And, um, my dad's a poet. Call it to my dad. Thanks, Michael Decker. Um, <laughs> uh, Tarkovsky, obviously, love Tarkovsky. Um, I really, and also, I like, you know, I really, Andrea Arnold, my God, I just think she's a genius. And, um, you know, she's, it's not actually, ironically, she doesn't do the surreal so much. She does like super real, but she shoots in such a, in a way that feel it's so textural and sensual. And I think that's something that I really responded to. And maybe there's a surrealness to that kind of the immediacy of the imagery and, and the experience of her films. And um, I, I feel that way about Darren Aronofsky also. I, I really like Darren Aronofsky's work and kind of how, how visceral and intense it is. Like Black Swan, I just love Black Swan um, so much. Uh, but those are a few. <laughs> Um, next question is, uh, did you find it fun or liberating directing a film about such a dark dame? Oh, wow. Did I find it fun or liberating? You know, yeah, both, definitely. And it's so fun because Shirley's so like Barbie and has all these like thorns, but she's also very vulnerable and sensitive and, um, and that kind of complex contradictory character is just it's wonderful to bring that person to the screen because you get, it's so unpredictable. Lizzie's performance was always incredibly unpredictable. And then when we were editing, we, we could make choices that made her even like more unpredictable. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, it was very, very fun. And you know, the, I think the liberating part is, um, honestly, it's kind of been having a voice myself. Like it took a long time. I made a lot of movies that, 
I didn't think anyone was going to, most, most people didn't see them. <laughs> and, um, and there, there's kind of a, uh, you know, getting to, getting to work on work about a really famous artist and, and then have that be the biggest step, stepping stone that I've had in my career is so powerful. And, um, yeah, I really, I guess I feel very, very blessed mm -hmm. by that experience. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I also think you were very blessed to have Elizabeth Moss. I mean, she's obviously like the perfect person for this. And somebody asked uh, how Elizabeth Moss got involved in the project and uh, did she add anything, it sounds like from your previous answer she did, that wasn't in the script to the character. So she, we, we, I mean, we were very clear, like immediately when I came on the project that Lizzie was like our top choice. <laughs> and I think, but I think she had already like been in Sarah's mind. I mean, we all were big fans and um, she's just so nuanced. And I, I don't know that she does anything where you don't a hundred percent believe her. You just fully believe her, you know, which is, I, I don't know, you know, many actors, sometimes you can feel the performance, but this, she just, you never can. And, um, uh, and then she, the nuance, you know, it's, that character is so wild. I mean, and in a way you don't have any idea what that, what she's going to look like on film. So in a, I felt like Lizzie just um, captured her really perfectly. I think one of the things that wasn't, I didn't expect about Shirley, you know, she read in the script very kind of, um, like maybe one word is ugly. Like she read kind of like gross-ish. <laughs> like she had like her, she was always kind of like falling apart and the crumbs and the pantyhose falling down. And um, and uh, and Lizzie is, and I think that was, I mean, well, obviously she's, she's a very beautiful woman. And um, I think there was, I think we all, it was funny because when we take off, she, she had these glasses obviously that she wore for, um, for Shirley and and then when she would take them off I don't know it was just it was interesting to like see this sensitive vulnerable person kind of under there and I think those the yeah there was a lot there was just a lot of vulnerability I guess um and it, and that's there in the script but I think it was really she really kind of brought it home that this woman is mm -hmm. uh, wounded mm -hmm. Uh, another question from the audience is, uh, if you see parallels in how Shirley Jackson viewed herself as an outsider and current conversations about underrepresented voices in film. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, um, I think she, I think, I, I mean, I, well, I think obviously there's, I just want to be sensitive because I feel like what's going on and, um, you know, giving more space for, for black and indigenous people of color are, are and people of color, I, I think is really important. And obviously Shirley is a white woman. <laughs> um, uh, and I, so I don't want to like, you know, say that she was marginalized in that way. I think she did though. Um, she, she was, I think she was a very thoughtful human being. I think, they uh, at that for the time period that she was in, she she had a lot of she had a lot of friends of color. Stanley, her husband, um, uh, uh, got a famous uh, black writer to become a professor at Bennington College, and um, he, and so you know they basically you know the sort of vibe is that probably and the people of color who were in visiting Bennington were mostly there because of Shirley and Stanley, um, and. Uh, and, you know, but I think she, she really had, she had a really complicated upbringing. She had a pretty abusive mother, her relationship with her mother was kind of emotionally abusive and, and, um, and her relationship with Stanley obviously kind of was too, at least, you know, it, from what I understand, obviously I didn't live it. Um, but so, you know, and I think sometimes when you, when you, when you don't have someone to hold you up, you sort of always feel like you don't belong, you know? And I think so. I think she carried that with her. And um, uh, yeah, I guess that's a more personal, personal mm -hmm. journey, but, um, but I think she would have been out there protesting right now for sure. <laughs> um, another audience question is, did you do any research on the real life Paula Jean Weldon and her disappearance? 
And why do you think it inspired Shirley Jackson? Gosh, you know, our, I, Sarah really dug into the, the real life Paula Jean Weldon. Um, I didn't, you know, once we, no, I, I didn't really get into the real life Paula Jean Weldon that much. You know, more, we were obviously working in this fictional realm. And so we were looking at how did she, I, I was mostly looking at how did she function in our story and how did that ghost kind of character, how does Paula function in our story? So I was very concerned about that. But, um, you know, and I was even at some points worried about giving her the same name since Paula was the name of, of the actual girl who went missing. So, um, but it turned out that some for some reason that was okay, <laughs> you know, that we could put her name in the movie. But yeah, but it's, it's a, um, but no, I didn't do that much research about her um, personally. But Sarah did. Sarah, our writer, really went into it. So she, we would just ask her questions, then she would, you know, feed them back. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question from the audience is about one of your esteemed executive producers. Uh, how did Martin Scorsese get involved, and what were your conversations with him like in regard to this project? It, by the way, it's just so nice to get audience questions. Like I have done a, a good amount of Q and A's, and and almost and there's like maybe we get to two audience questions, so this is so nice. Um, so, m m Mr. Scorsese, <laughs> um, wow, what a dreamy! It was just the funniest actual process because I, so I had shown two films at, or my first film, Better on the Latch, at First Time Fest, uh, which is a, a festival in New York City. Um, and one of the women who runs it, Joanna Bennett, was like, you know, M Marty wants to work with you and you should really meet with Marty and you really should talk to his assistant, Lisa, and you got to meet Marty. And I was like, I just thought, I was like, she is the wrong person. She's talking about somebody else. He saw someone else's film and like liked it, and, you know, and different film had won, you know, and he, I think he got to vote on, you know, so I was like, he isn't, that's not, this is not real. Like she's totally confused. But she, every time I saw her for like three years, she would bring it up. And I was like, and then she's like, why don't you just have lunch with his assistant? And I was like, okay. And I'm still thinking like, when are they going to realize I'm not the person that they mean to be talking to? And so I, I meet with, with Lisa, who's just a sweetheart. And we had a really nice, like fun, fun time talking and catching up. And she's like, oh yeah, you know, Marty really wants to work with you. And again, I'm just like, I still think they have the wrong person. And so finally, um, we sent the script for Shirley to them. He was in the middle of the Irishman. And so, um, he didn't like it with timing and everything being so crazy. It was, it actually took, we were almost th done with the film by the time he actually came on. Um, but, uh, then, then I remember that first conversation and he was like, I just really love Butter on the Latch, <laughs> which was just like amazing. I mean, it's the weirdest, I think it's the weirdest movie ever, but you could, I sort of understand why he liked it. Cause he's such a, he loves that kind of, he loves realism and, um, mm -hmm. and that and it has a lot of energy. It's set on a real Balkan folk song and dance camp. And he has this like music doc love too. So I, I you know, it made sense after the fact, but um, yeah, for a while I was like, how, what, you know, um, but really grateful. I'm so, I feel very blessed that I've gotten to meet him and talk to him and, and, and work with him on this. Um, I think we can, we have time to squeeze in one more question. Okay. Uh, so well, actually we get, I'll do, we get two more here from the audience. Um, one of which is, uh, I'm sure you get this a lot. Is there any advice you can give to, uh, starting filmmakers? Yeah, I think. A couple things. One is just make your art. You know, it's if you can make it for three dollars, make it because um, waiting for someone to say yes is brutal and just can just take. You know, I think for me it took like ten years for anyone to start saying yes to my art, and that. But I just started to make things for what I could and kickstarted it up. You know, um, begged mom and dad to give me money. You know, like that kind of thing. And it, um, and that's, you know, and that's also, you know, obviously speaking of privilege, that's a big privilege to be able to do that because that's, I think, you know, a lot of why filmmakers, you know, it's not the most diverse profession in the world or, or is a film directors. Um, uh, and, but, I, you know, whatever resources you have, I would really try to try to make, just try to make stuff because then you find your voice and then, and then people want you to make work in your voice as opposed to, you know, fulfill a idea. Um, and the other thing is like, um, and this is maybe for people like me, I don't know if everyone 
feels this way, but I just generally don't think I'm right. I think I'm, I think I'm wrong all the time. And I just think, and so, uh, it makes you a good listener, I guess, but that, that you are the person who needs to be happy when your film is done. And so to just try to trust yourself and, and ask for what you need and don't be afraid to ask for what you need. And, um, obviously don't exploit anyone, <laughs> but like ask, you know, try to, try to be honest about what you're trying to do and, and push and, and, and get it, you know, like don't, st if a take isn't what you're excited by, nobody, you know, don't move, don't move on until you, until you love it, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good, good advice. Uh, all right. Well, for the last question, uh, we've got a question that is not a film question. It is, since you mentioned you're an avid poetry reader, where do you suggest a poetry novice start? Oh, great. Oh, that's nice. This is so interactive. Look, we get yeah, responses. Um, you know, I think a good starting place, I was just looking at my po poems on my, my wall of poetry. Okay, so Mary Oliver is amazing and she's pretty like user friendly. I think you can, uh, Mary Oliver will, will uh, you will like, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't like Mary Oliver. Um, I also love Sharon Olds, uh, Mary Ruefle, R-U-E-F-L-E. -E. Um, those are probably three of my top, Lynn Emanuel, L-Y-N-N Emanuel, um, is also really wonderful. And, um, I love some Rainer Maria Rilke. Wow, profound. Um, uh, and Vislava Zimborska. It's also a really fascinating poet. So um, sounds, the, the last name for Vislava is S-Z-Y-M-B-O-R-S-K-A. So uh, anyway, those are some that I, that I really love. I know I'm like, maybe we should close this by me reading a poem. Would that be appropriate? Hold on, yeah. let's grab a, a little Mary Oliver. Uh, I carried this one, Blue Horses, all over the country. Let me see if I can just grab one. Right? Is that okay? Do we have time? Let's do it. Perfect. Okay. Um, <laughs> this one, I mean, I just like opened it to one. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. On meditating, sort of. This is just like, I just turned to a random page of Blue Horses by Mary Oliver. Meditation, so I've heard, is best accomplished if you entertain a strict posture. Frankly, I prefer just to lounge under a tree. So why should I think I could ever be successful? Some days I fall asleep or land in that even better place, half asleep, where the world, spring, summer, autumn, winter, flies through my mind in its hearty ascent and its uncompromising descent. So I just lie like that while distance and time reveal their true attitudes. They never heard of me and never will or ever need to. Of course, I wake up finally thinking, how wonderful to be who I am, made out of earth and water, my own thoughts, my own fingerprints, all that glorious temporary stuff. <sighs> Well, Josephine, this has been great. I want to thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Thank and uh, I want to remind everybody who's watching that if you have not seen Shirley yet, or if you want to see it again, you can actually stream it on the American Cinematheque's website. Uh, and it's on Hulu and all kinds of places. So uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. And hopefully, maybe sometime later this year, we can actually show it at the Cinematheque on the big screen. And, do this again with a real live audience. I would love that. And thank you all. Thank you so much for, 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 for hosting us. And, and thank, thanks, thank you, Jim. And thanks to all of you in the audience. Thank you for your questions. It's so nice to receive audience questions. I really, really can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, Josephine. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.